tonight, the most intense day of fighting so far in the Israel-Hamas war. <laughs> Running out of options in Gaza. There is no place to go that is safe. And investigating allegations of horrific sexual violence by Hamas. And the world should know. A dramatic increase in eating disorders among boys. One day I should start not eating anything. Plus, a concerning math score on the nation's report card. Also, legendary soccer star Christine Sinclair's farewell. And a Christmas blast from the past. Rocking around the Christmas tree at the Christmas party hop. A Brenda Lee classic tops the charts 65 years later. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. There are graphic allegations emerging tonight of Hamas's use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. Disturbing accounts of Israeli women repeatedly raped and mutilated. Some who can't even offer their own testimonies because they were killed in the October 7th attack. CTV's Heather Wright on the atrocities and Israel's stepped up ground offensive in the south, leaving Palestinians in Gaza with fewer places to shelter. Israeli forces say today was the most intense day of combat since their ground offensive into Gaza began. Troops are now inside Khan Yunus, where officials believe Hamas leadership is operating and may also be holding hostages. The stepped up bombardment leaving these women trapped on the top of this building and sending scores of injured people to Nasser Hospital, where doctors are struggling to keep up. The patients are on the floor, this health ministry spokesman says. Hospitals in the south have totally collapsed. Over the last 72 hours, the amount of airstrikes on Khan Yunus is unprecedented. Canadian-Palestinian Mansour Shoman is one of the many people living at Nasser Hospital. While Israel warns citizens to leave Khan Yunus ahead of what's being described as intense urban combat, Shoman says there are few other options. There is no place to go that is safe. Even if people wanted to leave Gaza and go into Egypt, it's not allowed. The border is closed. In Israel, family members of the hostages met with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today. A meeting described by some as turbulent, as frustration over the government's handling of the hostages boils over. They are dying slowly each day. Speaking after the meeting, Netanyahu described haunting stories of sex crimes from hostages who have been released. I heard about sexual assault in cases of brutal rape, he says. Israeli police are looking into similar allegations from the October 7th massacre, releasing video of eyewitness accounts that describe mutilation and rape. He was basically shifting her position, she says, and then passed her on to another person. Some of the terrorists that are interrogated, they're saying that this was happening and this was done. Hamas has denied all allegations of sexual assault and mutilation by its armed wing. The United Nations says it will investigate these allegations as part of an inquiry into alleged war crimes on both sides. But Israel has condemned the UN, saying it has remained silent for too long when it comes to these accusations. Omar. Heather Wright in Toronto tonight. Among all the horror in this war was a moment of hope today. <laughs> this was five-year-old Emilia Loni's return to school after seven weeks as a hostage. She was welcomed back by her kindergarten classmates and her teacher. An alarming new report is suggesting the problem of sexual misconduct in the military is getting worse. The information not from a whistleblower this time, but Stats Canada highlights a spike in the number of complaints. CTV's Judy Trin reports. The Canadian military's attempts to change its culture is adrift. A new report by Statistics Canada reveals the rate of sexual assault went up in 2022. In a survey of 23,000 Canadian Armed Forces members, more than 1,900 soldiers said they were sexually assaulted by other members. That represents 3.5% of the force. 
The cases are more than twice as high as they were in 2018, data that puts the government on the defensive. I believe we are truly on a path of meaningful and lasting cultural change, but the results of this survey also show us clearly that there's a great deal more work to do. More members said they were subjected to unwanted touching and sexual attacks and activity without their consent. 21% reported incidents in 2022, down from 25% in 2018. The main reason cited? A belief it would not make a difference. Donna Rigadell, a sexual assault survivor, left the force after suffering PTSD. She's concerned about the lower reporting rates. They said because they don't feel like anything will change. And that just, that made me so sad because there, there's just a loss of hope and a feeling of defeat. Since 2015, there have been two external reviews by former Supreme Court justices, Marie Deschamps and Louise Arbour. Sexual assault cases have now been moved to civilian courts, but it has not improved reporting. There was one bright spot. The survey did show more soldiers were willing to intervene. Even though it shows bystander training is working, we still got to, we have work to do. The StatsCan report also found that alcohol was a factor in 30% of the sexual assaults. Now that the holiday season is here, the defense minister says he expects military leaders to closely supervise social gatherings. Omar. All right, Judy, thank you. Quebec's coroner is investigating after two people died waiting for care at an overcrowded emergency room in a Montreal suburb. For two or three days to be at 150, 200 uh, percent, we can survive, we manage. But when it's been two, four, six weeks in an Alaberge case, uh, it does become dysfunctional. An Alaberge hospital is known for notoriously long wait times. Both patients died within 24 hours of each other last week. The province's health minister called the deaths unacceptable, but warned that wait times will worsen with the onset of this year's flu season. Montreal Mayor Valérie Plante is on the mend after a sudden health scare during a news conference today. I would... Um... Plante collapsed while taking a reporter's question. Her staff surrounded her immediately and called for medical attention. She says she will reduce the pace of her engagements in the coming days. There is a disturbing new medical snapshot tonight on the surge of young people with eating disorders. An Ontario study looked at close to 12,000 hospitalizations of children between 5 to 17 years old between 2002 and 2019 and found an increase of 139 percent. Female patients make up the vast majority, but the largest increase was among males. CTV's Kevin Gallagher has more. During the pandemic, eating disorders among children increased. Emil Bernstein was 13 when he started skipping meals and snacks while working out obsessively, hoping for a superhero body. I almost felt like I had two minds, kind of. Like, one of the eating disorder and other myself. His family noticed he wasn't himself and were shocked when he dropped below 60 pounds, nearly sending him to hospital. I, I was told that I was going to be getting a tube down my throat and get food like down there and that totally did not make me feel good. So that I think that was like the turn. Though an increasing number of children with eating disorders do end up in hospital. A new Ontario study found that between 2002 and 2019, there was a 123% increase in female patients admitted, a 196% jump in younger teens between 12 and 14, and the largest increase was in boys, rising 416%. By the time someone may be admitted to hospital care, they have been suffering for a very long time, likely and often, and that those who finally do get into the hospital, there can't be enough spaces for all those that are suffering. The study attributes the increase in part to reduced stigma, allowing more people to come forward and be diagnosed, though some experts warn solutions should focus on keeping people out of hospital. It tells you that our preventative treatment and our initial treatments and our outpatient treatments are not working because most of these kids should not end up in hospital if we were doing our job right. The authors say data on eating disorders is limited, suggesting the numbers may actually be higher. Omar? All right, Kevin, thanks. A shocking end to a police standoff near Washington, D.C.
A suburban home in Arlington, Virginia, erupted into a ball of fire as officers attempted to serve a search warrant. Police say the homeowner fired several gunshots and discharged a flare gun as many as 40 times before the explosion. The 56-year-old was inside the house during the blast and is presumed dead. The cause of the explosion is under investigation. No casualties from a wind-fueled grass fire north of Calgary. All afternoon, crews battled the flames believed to have been caused by downed power lines. There was no significant damage. Fireworks and burning have been banned in the area. According to a damning new report from the government of New Brunswick, a scrapyard in St. John is an environmental health and safety risk. That's among the findings of a task force that was set up to investigate a massive fire at the facility three months ago. There have been more than 20 fires at the scrapyard since 2011. And as CTV's Sarah Plowman says, this latest one may have been the last straw. Smoke spewed like a volcano. But this was a mountain of metal near hundreds of homes in St. John. It was scary. It was really scary. That was mid-September. New Brunswick suspended American Iron and Metals Harbor Front Scrapyard and launched a task force that today shared what it found. That a catastrophic fire similar to that of September 14th, 2023 could reoccur. The recycling plant sits next to St. John's Harbor near homes and parks. The report concluded the scrapyard's location is entirely inappropriate given its hazards and risks. It also found the city's fire department isn't equipped to respond to a fire like this and that most of the water that put out the fire was pumped from a vessel that's usually in Newfoundland but happened to be in St. John. Had the Osprey not been in port, the repercussions for the community would have been disastrous. The mayor has criticized the facility's location, but praised the report's thoroughness. Now the next steps will be for the regulator to take action. And so I'm hoping that that will happen relatively quickly. The people of St. John have been anxiously waiting on pins and needles. Residents have mixed opinions. Off camera, one person noted the scrapyard employs people. Others want it moved. They should take it out of the city, actually, and put it into an industrial park that's way away from the city. The justice minister stressed that activity at that scrapyard is suspended, and that decision rests with regulators. CTV News reached out to American Iron and Metal for comment, but did not hear back. Omar. All right, Sarah, thank you. Canada is consistently losing marks in math despite being a top performer globally. That's according to a new international study of high school students. CTV's Kreese and Adjikate crunches the numbers. University student Bridget Halliday admits she had a tough time with math in high school. I found starting in middle school, it became a big challenge. And then once you don't get that foundation, I think it just gets worse and worse. Here, there are three sets. A new report is reinforcing the concern about how the subject is taught. 12% of 15-year-old Canadian students were top performers in math. Compare that to Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan and Korea, where the percentages are much higher. Canada's overall score has been on the decline each year since 2003, with one in five students scoring at the lowest level. Math is a really cumulative subject and it needs a lot of practice and students need to be taught using effective methods. And I think a lot of times we're seeing philosophies across the country, instructional philosophies that just aren't effective. With fewer mathematicians starting at an early age, Canada needs to reevaluate in how it teaches mathematics, according to this expert. It will leave us behind as a country, I think, and reliant on other countries to provide the um, innovations. As for Halliday, extra support and study groups at Dalhousie University have made it a subject she now enjoys. Finding what works for you, getting support where you need it, working on your strengths and weaknesses. Canada is still among the top performers globally, but experts believe the declining trend needs to be addressed, as math is so critical, especially in the advancement in artificial intelligence and data science. Omar. All right, Kreeson, thank you. Coming up. He maintains that he should have a higher level of security. Prince Harry's legal battle for royal protection.
U.S. President Joe Biden said today he likely wouldn't be seeking re-election if Donald Trump wasn't in the mix. Biden told a fundraising event in Boston that if Trump weren't running, he wasn't sure he'd be running, adding they cannot let him win. Trump is seen by many observers as the frontrunner for the Republican presidential nomination. During the 2020 campaign, Biden said that a big reason he ran was because of Trump's term at the White House. Prince Harry's legal battle with the British government started today, his lawyer arguing that he was unfairly stripped of his taxpayer-funded security detail after he gave up his status as a working royal. Harry also insists he needs that protection when he visits the UK. CTV's Vanessa Lee on the showdown. Prince Harry's lawyer told the court the group evaluating his security needs acted irrationally and treated him unfairly by failing to follow its own policies. One of the requirements was a risk analysis of the Duke's safety. Government lawyers argue Harry had been treated fairly and arrangements are based on the perceived risk, as is the case with other high-profile visiting dignitaries. Harry says he doesn't feel safe bringing his wife Meghan Markle and their two young children back to Britain. He, you know, has stated occasions where that lower level of security here in the United Kingdom hasn't been enough in 2021 when he was at a well child event uh, in the, the court documents. It talks about uh, cars being intercepted. Earlier this year, Prince Harry lost a legal bid to privately pay for police security while in the UK. This case is one of five Harry has pending in London's high court. The others involve Britain's best known tabloids, including a lawsuit that alleges journalists used unlawful means to try and dig up dirt about him. No comment has been made by Buckingham Palace, by King Charles or Queen Camilla. Hearings for this case are expected to run until Thursday and will largely be held in private because of the sensitive information being discussed. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. And police north of Toronto may have caught the runaway kangaroo, but she has captured the hearts of many. Okay, 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 it's okay, it's okay. okay. New video shows officers trying to calm the anxious marsupial moments after she was found. Turns out this recording was courtesy of the kangaroo herself. She accidentally turned on an officer's body cam in her frightened attempt to flee. Still ahead, kicking off a fitting farewell. The final bow as legendary soccer star Christine Sinclair hangs up her cleats. One of the greatest athletes in Canadian history is hanging up her cleats after a distinguished career. Christine Sinclair on the pitch in Vancouver one last time in an international game against Australia. CTV's Bill Fortier on the star's record-smashing run as one of the sport's top players. When you think about soccer in Canada, it's impossible to avoid this career, this unbelievable skill, this name. In an absolutely dominant evening, Christine Sinclair. BC-born Christine Sinclair has wowed fans here and around the world for more than two decades. Tonight, she laced up the cleats for her final international match, along with veteran midfielder Sophie Schmidt, also retiring. Yeah, I think it's kind of sinking in now that this is it. Among her accolades... Lauren Sinclair! It's 190! Her 190 goals in international play is the highest of any player ever, female or male. She led Team Canada to two Olympic bronze medals and that stunning gold in 2020. She's also raised the profile of soccer in Canada, a role model and mentor to young players. We wouldn't be able to play in front of 45,000 people in BC Place without Sinky and Soph. They've brought this program from the bottom up. These players got into the game as kids in part because of Sinclair. She showed like what women can do for soccer in Canada and she showed the world too. Now they're playing for Edmonton's McEwen University and have aspirations of playing pro soccer and even wearing a Team Canada jersey. I think that's pretty much like every little girl's dream is like, like playing soccer is to hopefully one day wear that jersey and play for your country. There's no secret, it's a lot of work, but man, it's the best job in the world. As her time in a Canada jersey wraps up, a message of thanks from fans and players. I think I'm just very grateful for what she's done for women in Canada. She really paved the way for sport. In honor of her big night, BC Place has been temporarily nicknamed Christine Sinclair Place. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Edmonton. And a soccer star in the men's game added a new accolade to his football resume. 
Eso para Leo. Ahí está Messi, 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 Messi. Golazo, 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 golazo. Lionel Messi was named Time Magazine's Athlete of the Year for 2023. He guided Argentina to glory in 2022 at the World Cup in Qatar and achieved a lifelong dream. After the break, the return of a Christmas star. Rocking around the Christmas tree, let the Christmas spirit ring. Rocking to the top of the charts 65 years later. At the top of the Billboard Hot 100, a song that will probably be playing in your head after this. Brenda Lee's Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree, recorded 65 years ago, shot up to the top spot for the first time ever. Here's CTV's Genevieve Beauchemin. Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree at the Christmas Party Hop. Brenda Lee, 78 years old, recorded her very first music video, lip syncing and hopping to her old holiday chestnut. The Christmas tree. Hi, I'm Brenda Lee. And she joined TikTok, marking the song's 65th anniversary. Now her rocking tune is the shining star topping the charts. It's the longest climb from release to number one on record. And the crooner most definitely got a sentimental feeling when she heard. Today, we're number one on the Hot 100 Billboard charts, 65 years later. No one, you are. Lee was just 13 years old when she lent her vocals to the tune, recording it in a Nashville studio during the summer of 1958. I'll never forget. I walked in the studio, had all the lights turned down, the air conditioning on was in, uh, was on full blast. The Christmas tree there was all lit up. The petite firecracker was an early pioneer of rock and roll and had two other songs reach number one, but never her holiday classic, though it had gone platinum five times before. It also got a new generation rockin' in 1990 when it made it onto the Home Alone soundtrack. They said, Brenda, Brenda, your song's in Home Alone. I said, so what? Who, what is that? <laughs> Still over the past few years, it was Mariah Carey's holiday anthem locking up the season's top spot. Now this old-fashioned number one is the signature song streaming this season. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Definitely an earworm. That's a snapshot of this Tuesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching and good night.